is awesome. Welcome to this week's edition of Everything is Awesome. I am your host, Kev, and this is the show where we sit down and talk to awesome people about awesome things. It is the first official show I have sat down to record in 2017. It is the first official show I have, uh, we, we are recording in year two of Everything is Awesome. I think we're three episodes deep at this point, uh, but it's the first one that I'm actually sitting down and recording. Uh... It is a last-minute buy-in. Uh, they get my. I had a guest cancel on me, and it just kind of worked out perfectly. He's not a stranger to this show. His credits include, um, you know, a, f- a few podcasts, a wicked accent, and uh, and just a really, really uh, great nerdy, uh, you know, knowledge base. Please welcome to the show the host of the Saturday Detention Podcast. Uh, also the co-host of the newly launched Zomcast that you'll be hearing at some point, uh, in the next couple days, I think, uh, Steve, you know, we're so far in of us talking. I still don't have your last name, but Steve. Yep. uh, As I've said before, man, it's kind of like, it's kind of like Madonna or Cher, Yes. you know, it's, that's where it seems to be at this point, mate. But, um, no, the surname is Conroy. So it's Steve Conroy. Steve Conroy. Yeah. So good, good Irish name. Okay. Yeah. There you go. I like it. That's uh. We, okay. We got a cu- couple of Irish boys here. Kevin Michael Gallagher. You don't get much more Irish than that. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me on, man. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to it. I'm a. I'm a big fan of the podcast, as you know. That's how we uh kind of first hooked up, and uh, and I'm looking forward to sitting down and having a chat with you. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, anyone that's listening to this episode, you, you've probably listened to uh, the Everything is Awesome Invasion special that we did, and uh, that's what we brought Steve on for that, uh, because we had just been going on, uh, you know, just down the waterhole of various uh, nerdy things that, like, that week, talking about the Zomcast and the Walking Dead and, and all that fun stuff. Um, and I actually just got done, I'm, I'm behind on my, my DC uh, CW shows. Uh, so I just got done watching last week's Flash, um, and boy, let me tell you. So before we actually get into like the interview portion of the show, which will probably be at the like the last quarter of the show, uh, have you? Are you caught up on the uh, CW shows? Uh, the last ones I saw were Invasion, man. Oh no! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was- so it was. Um, it's it's only been because it was something we touched on with. Um, uh, when we were talking about the invasion episode, it did that much good TV, um, and okay. I I actually did something which I promised you that I would do, and I've been using the time for the mid season break to catch up with Supergirl. Oh, all right. So, what did you go back to season one? Season one, I went back to season one. I've I've ploughed through that, and I am just about to hit season uh, the first episode of season two. So I'm just about to dive into the Superman episodes. And right, okay. um, and I I gotta say I definitely enjoyed it a lot more than people may expect based on my reaction to Medusa. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm telling you that that series is that it, it's if you like the Flash, I think it's it's hard for you to not like Supergirl because they are so similar in tone. Um, I think. They are more, and and they, you know, based off of um, the season one crossover, based off of Invasion, uh, based off of the uh, episode that actually just aired last week, and then there's another Flash Supergirl crossover planned for the back half of season three here. They, I like that's that's way more intermingled with one another, and they're in two separate universes than Flash and really any of the other shows arrow or legends and the 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 flash supergirl crossover was it it was there was it wasn't anything you know uh earth shattering as far as the threat went it wasn't anything that um was like you know a high grade kind of comic book threat but the interaction between those two made that one of one of the best episodes of both seasons that um, so that at that stage the Flash would have been in season two, and yeah. Supergirl was in season one. It is possibly my favourite F- Flash slash Supergirl episode from both of those seasons. 
it is definitely was a highlight of, of last year. It was, um, it just, it's, I, I said it before and this is probably gonna be the third or fourth time I've said it. it it's so adorable that, that, that those, you know, those two characters, um, and that, that episode as a whole was just so, so adorable. I, I mean, I enjoyed it, you know, thoroughly. I'm looking forward to the, uh, the, this year they're going to be doing another crossover where, uh, what, who is it? Music Meister, uh, is the villain and it's going to be a musical episode. I think it's going to be fantastically great. Well, at the moment I've got, uh, full faith in the, the entire DC TV universe, more so than I do the movie universe. Um, to the point where I really don't yeah. care what character comes next. I don't. I know that there's going to be another show somewhere down the line. There, they have to be looking at it, going, "This is our money maker right now," and so there's going yeah, to be they, a new show. Oh yeah. Well, they. Um, I don't know. So I don't know how. So, uh, we should say that uh, if, you know those listening, if you don't know by now, Steve is in Australia. He's he is. He's, you know, for me, for us East Coast boys, he's in the future. He is a time traveling uh, podcaster, as far as we're concerned. <laughs> he's already seen what it looks like at 10 a.m. on February 7th. It's still February 6th, 10 30. Welcome to right the here. world of tomorrow. <laughs> um, but uh, so I don't know if, if you've read or whatnot, uh, or if I missed it when you dropped out, but. The um, uh, Black Lightning, is it, is, is coming to the CW. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, yes. nice. Uh, it, was, it was being developed being developed for Fox. Fox passed on it because they have so much going on with um, a couple genre shows and, and whatnot, and they just didn't feel like they had room for it. So um, CW is gonna is gonna take it, make it part of the Berlanti universe, and oh, um, lovely. We're off to the races. So I mean, they are expanding that universe, and a lot of people are calling for. What are we? We're in season five of Arrow right now. I, a lot of people are coming together and saying that season six of the Arrow, which it, it has been renewed for. Uh, they they are calling for that to be the last season. Um, because, you know, obviously last season was, uh, not a highlight season for Arrow. Yeah. Uh, I think it's been rocking season five, I think is back to your, you're back to your basics with Arrow. You're back to the great stories that it was before. Um, but I, I mean, I think that Arrow is suffering from just the, the, what every show self suffers from at some point it's been around for so long. It can't outdo itself anymore. Also, Arrow has the disadvantage that none of the other shows have is Arrow was around for, what, two and a half, three seasons before it had another show to cross over with. Yes. So The Flash, Legend of Tomorrow, even Supergirl, which, like you mentioned, was on a completely different network, have all had the advantage of being able to pull from everything that Arrow mm -hmm. set up previously. The Arrow had to set everything up. So it's probably more likely to make mistakes or missteps than any of the, the other shows. But if Arrow does go, if season six is the last season of Arrow, the great thing about this universe means it's not the end of Arrow. Yeah. yeah. It's still got, at the moment, three other shows. You mentioned Black Lightning, which is, which is the fourth, where they can pop up. You can still be seeing Arrow like ten times in a season because he could do one episode in, in Flash, two in Legend of Tomorrow, pop up in Supergirl, all of, you know, he's not a character that has to go away, but then the resources yeah. can go into the other shows. Yeah, and, and I, I don't know that I'd be necessarily upset by that. Uh, I, I love Stephen Amell. I think he is a phenomenal actor. Uh, I think that he his portrayal of Oliver Queen is just, just spot on. Um, but you know, it's, it, it's just, I, I'm not ready for it to go. I think right now season five has proven to me that I'm ready for season six. And if it continues, uh, into season six this way, I'm ready for season seven. Um, but I'm also like, I, I'm the guy who will pretty much forgive a lot of, uh, terrible, um, terrible movies for good quote unquote storytelling for, for good 
just good. I love comic book stuff. So like it's hard. You have to season four. I didn't lose it until probably the last three weeks of season four is when I finally said, "All right, this season's a little ridiculous." Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm the guy who who hung on for for the whole ten seasons of Smallville. You know, <laughs> and by that time you yeah. hadn't seen Smallville itself for three seasons. He before he'd even put on the cape and the and the S. Clark had managed to defeat all of the major Superman villains. So yeah. I was I was sitting there, but it was just out of this ridiculous loyalty to the fact that it's a Superman TV show and that this there's this horrible curiosity that I have when I drop a show and then all of a sudden you hear, Oh, this is happening in it and it's like, Oh shit, now I've got to go back. Now I've got to go watch yeah. it. Yeah. Do I catch up with the season that I've missed out on or do I just jump in here? You know, it's like um, I, I I was about to jump out of Smallville and they brought Booster Gold in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, man, I'm a massive Justice League International fan. So as soon as they did that, I was like, well, I guess I'm here. And it was the Jeff Johns written episode as well, which became the highlight of the season. You had the, the Justice Society, Booster Gold, all of that kind of stuff going on with it. And, uh, and I'm the same, man. I will forgive a show... Um, for missteps up to a certain point. Yeah, and I and like I said, Arrow season four definitely got to that point. But I like I, said, I, I feel like I feel like season five thus far ha- has been just really good, a really strong season for them. And and as you and I discussed during our invasion special for everything is awesome. Um, you know, it's Arrow's invasion episode, which was also their one hundredth episode, kind of doubled as a, you know what repilot not a reboot but like hey here's what you missed for the last four and a half years uh now you're caught up you don't have to go back and rewatch it you're with us let's go forward with with arrow uh we're, we're firing firing on all cylinders well i think that you may have just coined a new phrase there i know I, I like it a lot repilot yeah. Everyone says yeah. reboot. Everyone I like says. It. I'll take credit for that. Yeah, oh, I've never heard it before, man. And there's a, there's a lot of people who talk a lot of shit on the internet. So you'd think we'd heard everything by now, but the uh, the expression repilot is it's an exact description of what that was. That was you were able to go back, you were able to show everything that came before, but then almost say, okay, new starting point. Everything else still exists, but let's mm-hmm. let's push forward now. So I love that repilot. Yeah, and and to do that during the invasion um, crossover where all those shows had their highest ratings, I think they have ever seen. Especially, you know, definitely this season. I think, I think the only thing that's ever done better th- better than those invasion episodes was maybe the Flash season one premiere. Yeah, uh, if I remember correctly. So, like, I mean, the highest numbers that all these shows have ever ever seen. Um, and, and it's just, it's a good time over that, at the, the Berlanti verse. It's, uh, I'm excited for it. And I don't know. Um, I, I think we may have touched on it. I, um, I, I'm part of this, uh, podcast network, uh, with everything is awesome. Core temp arts. And, uh, one of those shows on there is, is a, a TV ate my brains and it's a, a recap and, you know, people just hop on different hosts, hop in and out. So me and this one guy, we hopped in to talk about Flash for a little bit, and we went into what you and I kind of just touched on, on like the beauty of this universe is that you can phase Arrow out, and you can you can start something else up to replace it, but Stephen Amell is still on tap to play Arrow. I think it absolutely makes perfect sense, and I think they, they DC, I think, would allow them to do it at this point because of the failures that they've been having at the big box office with the, the big screen versions of these characters, they need to introduce Hal Jordan, uh, into this universe through one of these shows. Uh, I'd be even down with it, introduce it through Supergirl and have him be part of earth 48 or whatever the earth is and start a green lantern show as uh, do that when you're ready to phase out arrow and you have Green Lantern, and you're, and I think you're golden. Yeah, oh, I agree with you. I mean, you, and you've got a completely different genre with with Green Lantern as well. You've got a you've got a space cop, 
You can start introducing yeah. more of the, the cosmic elements of, of the DC universe. You can visit different planets, different characters. You can use that to bring Hawkman in. You can use it, you know, because uh, yeah. you go to Thanagar or something along those lines. Or you can, um, you know, and, you know, Green Lantern can have its own kind of law and order kind of sound that goes yeah. off. You know, yeah. every time something legal happens, we get the ding, ding. It's, uh, you know, it'd be great. I, I would actually be interested to see how Green Lantern would work uh, in this universe because I'm not convinced that... Like so, so going back to the invasion episodes, uh, the the dominators. I don't think that they were like they were obviously Earth Prime's villain. Uh, they weren't attacking Earth thirty eight where Supergirl was or forty eight or wherever she's from. But it seems like what we discovered is Flashpoint only affected Earth Prime. It didn't affect the other Earths, the other Earths, the other Earths. Or it didn't. It didn't seem like it affected space because they knew about it. They knew that that Barry fucked up. So I, I I feel like that if you're in space, maybe there you know there's only one space. There's only one set of dominators that that they happen to come to Earth Prime, but they they're not you know they're 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 aware of all the the multiverse that's just in Earth. Um, and, and I think there may be some evidence to that if you were to watch, uh, the, the second half of the, the CW seasons. Um, so once you start getting caught up on Supergirl and and getting into the back half of the, the seasons here, you, we, you and I could probably talk more about it. Um, but if that's the case, then you got this excellent hero now who maybe is earth prime, but he joins the green lantern, uh, the green lanterns and he can kind of easily hop between the different multiverses between Supergirl and, and flash because it doesn't really count in space. Well, you've got the perfect opportunity right now to bring an earth man into the green lantern core, because if, the Dominators knew about the, the effects of Flashpoint, then the Guardians of the Universe must know about yeah. it. There's no way that they couldn't if the Dominators know. Oh, yeah. So what they need to do now is they need to, to pull in the first human that, they've, that they've, they've recruited into the Green Lantern Corps because they need someone from Earth to be able to, to specifically find out for them what happened, how to contain it, what the actual effects were. And the only way you can do that is... You got to have a human there, you know. So it, it, the Flashpoint thing may also be a great jumping in point to introduce the Guardians of the Universe at some point. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what the Berlanti uh, verse is going to do. It's, it's, it's. They got a lot of big things, and I, and I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. Even if, even if the sh- one of the shows go, I think that uh, more so than I, I don't think Marvel has a strong. TV universe, even though it's all part of their their bigger grand scheme, um, I think DC is doing that right, and and I think they, you know, I think in ten years we're still going to have parts of this Berlanti verse. I don't know what they'll be, but I think in ten years we will one hundred percent still be sitting here talking about how Stephen Amell is appearing on one of these shows as Green Arrow in his fifteenth year of playing the role. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I'd, I've no doubt that this this universe has legs. And that's what's great, you know, and, and this could be like one of our final notes on it. It, it. It's a huge benefit to the actors too because, you know, most actors that, are, that come from television, they eventually kind of go up and want to do films. Uh, so, you know, the natural progression of Stephen Amell's career is going to say, you know, well, once Arrow kind of winds down, he's going to start doing more and more films. But you know what? He can go and still play with his friends in the as as Green Arrow easily, um, anytime he wants. So it's just it's such a perfect thing that they have going on over at CW, um, and and it, it is probably my most favorite thing. Uh, entertainment wise in the in the world right now as far as television is concerned well i i will give you one final thing on that i am there's only one thing which piques me at the moment more than the cw oh sorry the, the c, c where is it where is it on in america it is cw it is the cw 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, is um, the CW Melaniverse is fantastic. The only thing that I will go out of my way for more than that is Doctor Who. It is. Uh, I, I they they both neck and neck for my favourite because they're usually on at different times anyway. Like we've had a, a year of no Doctor Who, so this mm. has now been able to kind of peek over the top and uh, and pull me in a, a lot more. Um, yeah. But I think maybe there's a lot of the same storytelling elements, especially with the time travel and all of that kind of thing. But out of all of the the Blaniverse, which is your which is your favourite show? Oh, it's hands down. Well, uh, it's really tough to uh, pick between the Flash and Supergirl. Um, but you know, gun to my head, it's the Flash. It's yeah. just, um, it's just so good. I think it's the. They have yet to. I think. I think out of all the episodes they've had. It took them to get to season three, um, and om- like uh, like maybe an episode or two before invasion was an episode where I was like, "Yeah, this was kind of a misstep." Um, I, I, I the fl- every other show I'll watch and I'll say, "Eh, this episode was kind of." There was at least one episode I didn't like in every other show, uh, and it took three, two and a half years for Flash to do that. It's just, it's just. It's wonderful. I can't say enough good things about that show. Yep. What, what are you, what's your favorite? Uh, oh, it's, I'm, I'm with you. It's, it's got to be the Flash. They're just. Um, I, I think also I'm a I'm a huge fan of Cisco. I um I always um yeah. I always say to say to my daughter because we watch the Flash together. She loves it. Her, her, her favorite show on TV. She's ten, and uh, nice. and she loves it. Just every single week, she's like, "Are we watching the Flash? Are we watching the Flash?" And I'm <laughs> I'm in the bad books at the moment because I've held a few episodes back, and we we haven't had the time to watch them. But um, yeah, we just we both sit down and we just both plow through plow through an episode. Um, and uh, yeah, the Flash is just it's just um, there's a certain magic quality that the Flash has that that even though I love Legends of Tomorrow and I love the time-travelling aspect of it and all of that kind of thing, there's a thing about um, The Flash which each week makes me go, okay, I have to make sure I watch this. Yeah. You know, it's... Yeah, it's totally. It's the, I suppose the old expression is must-see TV. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and The Flash does that right. Um, <clears throat> so... Let's uh, let's get into a little bit of your your backstory. Let's go go a little bit into interview mode for a, a moment, if we may. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll derail it at some point. But uh, so so where's obviously you're from Australia, born and raised. No, born in England. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, born in England, came to Australia when I was about six. And yeah, um, okay, yeah, and uh, and been here ever since. So so uh, that you now, I guess this is a dumb question because you, it, you, it's not an accent to you, but I I would pin you as you know you sound very Australian versus you sound British. Oh is, yeah, I mean I there... um I uh, I've no idea like what happened, but I'm I'm not one of these people who held their original accent i've i've got people i went to school with you know though we we were kind of in second grade together and they came over and they're scottish and they still sound scottish um i i just kind of assimilated that's that's so interesting because i and I, I mean i i've never i've been in the philadelphia area my entire life and uh you know so i can't i can't wrap my head about like because now, at 32 years old, I move somewhere. I'm gonna always sound like this. Like I don't think I would ever. I don't. I would. I, my vo- My accent would never like just kind of migrate or, or assimilate, as you said, into whatever the local dialect was. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, I, that's fascinating. And and like you were six, so like that's pretty good age to be like, well, you know, I've talked like this for six years. It's how I want to be talking for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, but it's never, it's never even something. I don't even remember a time when someone said, "Oh, your accent changed or you sound different." So maybe back when I was a kid, I, I may not have just had a, a very thick English accent. You know, I may not have just, uh, uh, so it may not have been that, that difficult for me to lose. 
Well, you know what? That's, a, that's not, um, that makes a lot of sense because I don't think there's many, like I'm trying to think when I go down south or when I've traveled down south and it's, you know, the television plays Southerners, United States Southerners, uh, no matter their age, very much the same, very much that like slow drawn out, uh, that Southern draw that, that, you know, can make them sound less than intelligent at times. Uh, but I think that's gotta be, you know, I think way over the top because thinking back to going, you know, actually going down there, kids don't actually have accents usually. Like they have a little, it's slight, it's very slight compared to what their parents have. And I just imagine it gets deeper as they get older. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, that's probably some good science there. Yes, I we I've, learned something today. Yeah, it's it's never really something that I've I really really even consider. Like you said, I I don't consider myself to to have an accent. So when people go, oh man, you know, you must have been born in Australia. It's just like, ah, nah, born in England, <laughs> raised in Australia, and uh, yeah, on the uh, on the west coast. So, um, but we're kind of like you. We do have different accents for different cities like the 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 one that you hear people make a lot of fun of you know like the g'day mate hey you know all you know all of that kind of thing yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's a queensland accent okay that's um and uh i suppose that could almost be the equivalent to how you were just talking about the 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 southern accent that's uh, you know it's, it's one which even when you're australian you still turn around and go you're from queensland it's like you know <laughs> you can you can spot them a mile away and they're like, "Geez, how did you how did you guess?" It's like, "Oh man, like just because of the way that you talk, man, you know." And now all well, of a sudden, I've that's... lost every Queensland listener listener that that my podcast has. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's what's crazy is that like, so as an American, like I can hear the difference between like the the Northeast, which is like that Boston. Ah, you want to ride a wicker car? Uh, I can hear it's the difference between that and, it's, yeah. and I can hear the, hear the difference between me, which is Philly. I can hear the difference between like Southerners, which is that, you know, you know, I said very hickish Southern drawn out. Uh, and then like maybe Midwestern, like they're like the four things. However, there are people, and I guess it's because like in, in England and, and I guess in Australia, uh, where like it's, even though compared to the United States, uh, you know, it's a little bit, I guess, smaller size wise. Uh, there's a lot of different, um, you know, accents and like, I know, like England has what, like 16 like, different accents or some shit. Uh, and like everyone can tell that I'm from Philly. Like they can say, well, no, you have a Philadelphia accent. I'm like, what are you talking about? A Phil? I sound like the people on TV. <laughs> we all, we all sound the same. Like I'm the normal, like I don't sound like I'm from Phil. And it's, it's those little, like there's little things that I guess, you know, if, if people who travel to, you know, the, you know, the East coast or to Philly or whatever, like my, my dad has always go to stories. When he was a kid, he'd go to Canada and like Niagara falls area. And he, he'd be talking to somebody and they'd say, and they were, they were, I think they were, you know, Canadian or they were other t- tourists or whatever they say, Oh, you're from the Philly area, aren't you? And it's like our nasally O's, I guess. Like we have these, it's how we like nose. The way I say nose or Coke is not like, it's very different than like, uh, the Midwesterners or out in, you know, West coast. It's so strange to me when, when you can, the, the United States is the same, same as every other country where it's like, yes, even Philadelphia has a different accent than Pittsburgh, which is all in the same state. Well, see, we learn uh, American accents for me. They're actually quite easy to, to spot. Maybe the, the Philly one I may not have been able to recognize so much, but um, there is such an emphasis placed on accents in movies. Like, I can spot someone who's from New York. I can spot someone who's from Boston. I can spot someone who's from, you know, down south and all that kind of thing. And it's because of goodwill hunting. It's because of, you know, Forrest Gump. It's because of, it's because of all of these kind of things. The first time I heard the, the Boston accent full on would have been uh, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon doing goodwill hunting. You know, um, and I was just sitting there. And I still remember just being amazed by it. I was like, where are these guys from? 
you know and then all of a sudden there was the like it's almost Boston itself became a bit of a character in the in the um in the uh in the movie so there is a lot of um a lot of from my side of it in in American entertainment there is a lot of um emphasis placed on accents to set a location now maybe that's because you guys over there if you were to see a, a movie that was set in New York but the main characters had what you're referring to as the Philly accent you may not feel that it's authentic well, I'll, I'll say that New York, I don't think I'd feel that way personally because, like, I honestly, I don't hear when I talk, I, like, I know people in New York and I've talked to people in New York and, and, and maybe, like, New York City obviously isn't a great example because that's such a melting pot of people. But, like, if you go into the Bronx or Staten Island or something like that, I don't know that I've never, ever really noticed a different accent from those type of New Yorkers. Um, I only now do I know that like, Oh, Staten Island has like this, like a little bit of a weird accent because, you know, I, I want, I listen to tell them Steve, Dave, and they make fun of Q about it. Uh, <laughs> and, and, but, but other than that, like for me, that's like, I'd watch a movie that takes place in New York and they sound like me perfectly normal for me. Yep. Um, it's, it's, it's more so I would say the one place that it's like, and I've seen these movies, like, I don't know the names of them off the top of my head, but I've seen a movie that takes place in New England, in, in the, in Boston area. And the, the, the actors don't have that New England, Boston accent. Uh, and that, you're right. It does pull you out. Oh, you can probably hear the, uh, the dog decided to start up serious. He's become the third man on the podcast. What's up, buddy? You're good. <laughs> he wants to get. He wants some time. He wants some air time. Yeah. So oh, go uh, ahead. <laughs> you could be our Shecky. So, it's, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, the one. I mean, the the, the accent that <laughs> that sticks out big time for me is the uh, is the Jersey. Because we had that that huge influx over here of the, of, of a few years. Where it's very hard to forgive America for was the Jersey Shore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's, so that's uh, and uh, that was the that was the way those people spoke. That was that used to grate on me so so badly. You know, it wasn't just the the accent; it was that they didn't know half what half of the words they were using yeah. even meant. I, I, you know, I didn't really watch that too often because it was just such you know crap television. But like again, like I'll go to the Jersey Shore for vacation, and like no one, I don't, th and no one sounds like that. Like not, like no, I have never talked to anyone that sounds like that at all. <laughs> uh, and 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 maybe they do, maybe they do sound like that. And to me, I don't. I, I they had to overplay it because if, if people like that at the Jersey Shore talk like that on a regular basis, I I'd recognize it because uh, I can recognize it on the show. So I'm sure there's it's 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 a little bit like that in the Jersey Shore, but not as bad as that they they played it out. Oh, that's that's not one nice thing to hear. <laughs> uh, so where did the the love of um, podcasting come in for you? Like where what what where did that? Where's your podcasting origin point? Um, for me, it was being a a fan of um, uh, the TV show The Office when it first came out back in the day. Yeah. And uh, and Ricky Gervais. Which, okay, I was gonna say which version of The Office? The, yeah, the the, 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 the real one. The UK real one. one. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, it's uh, and so being a fan of of Ricky Gervais, I I um, I heard that he was doing this thing called a podcast, and I just at the time just picked up uh, my first iPod, um, and I had a fair commute to to work. I had like a forty five minute uh, drive to work each day. Um, and that was it. I started listening to that and then found that there were all different kinds of topics and, 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 uh, different genres and, and, and it was kind of when podcasting was just starting to, to actually boom because of, because of Ricky Gervais and, um, and that's where I got into it. And then, so now my, my consumption is probably, um, 15% normal radio, um, 85% podcasts. Yeah, uh, you know, I feel like that's the, the common thing between, you know, uh, maybe, I don't know if that's common between podcast listeners or, or podcasters, um, because, 
you know, there's, I know people who like will listen to a podcast here and there and then, uh, they, you know, they drop out and still listen to the radio. But a lot, I mean, a lot of people I know that are into podcasting, they have pretty much replaced regular radio with that. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm in the same boat. I started listening to podcasts, uh, pro- about 10 years ago. In fact, Kevin, uh, Kevin Smith's Smodcast started, uh, 10 years as the time of this recording, 10 years ago yesterday. Yep. And, uh, that is, and you know, it's funny cause I, I give credit to me podcasting to, to talk radio, not podcasting itself. Like my, my origin story is more so within the, uh, and I'm going to keep it short because my audience knows this already, but like Howard Stern, like Howard Stern is my entry point into talk radio. Yeah. Since I was a teenager, uh, driving around, I've never really listened to music. I always would just listen to talk radio, whether it was Howard Stern or some other local guys like kid Chris or Matt and Huggy, um, Opie and Anthony guys like that. Uh, and, and when podcasting, like when I first heard, you know, one of my, I think Kevin Smith's podcast started February 5th, uh, 2007. I probably started listening it to it, you know, a month or so after that. Uh, cause someone said, Hey, you know, Kevin Smith has this thing called a podcast. It's like a radio show. And, um, and that was the same way. And I traveled for work at the time. So, you know, I was either traveling, you know, four hours at a time or, you know, flying all the time. So that was where, you know, I, I podcasting for me started right around when you did, I guess, but it was with, with, uh, with Kevin Smith. And then I would pick up my own podcast in June of 2007. Uh, and then it was history writes itself. Yes. Well, I mean, it's, um, it's I mean, the, the thing about podcasting that I, that I love is, um, there's, there's two main reasons for it. It's first, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I started listening to, the Smodcast, uh, probably about 10 episodes in. Um, okay. And uh, again, it's because being a huge Kevin Smith fan and all that kind of thing, it was, it was a great way, and it still is, a great way to, to be able to, to, to get more of someone that you're a fan of. If you like someone's work or if you like, if, like a stand-up comedian or, or an, another celebrity who may do their own podcast and that kind of thing, um, you actually get the opportunity to... to to kind of connect with them in a small way, you know, it's a it's a one way street, um, as far as that goes most of the time. But it's great because it's like, um, you know, especially uh, early in the Nerdist, when they used to bring people on who didn't necessarily have anything to promote, but they just brought in people that they thought were cool or people they were friends with and. And, and that kind of thing. So you'd get people like Pat Oswald and Tom Lennon and, and those kind of guys. So I found it was great to, to source and seek out people who I was actually a fan of, the same way as I did with Ricky Gervais, Kevin Smith, all of, all of those kind of guys. But I also love being able to um, hear what other people think of things like film reviews or you know, uh, uh, people recapping a TV show or something like that, because it's it's just, you know, if I go see a movie and I've got an opinion of it, I just want to know what someone else's is. And that's how I started getting into to podcasts like, uh, yeah, it's that bad, um, the how did this get made, all of those kind of podcasts, you know, especially bad movie podcasts, because I've got this terrible, <laughs> terrible weakness for, for bad, bad movies. So well, that's what uh, that's what Halloween's all about is watching those hor- you know, horrible B uh, horror flicks. Yeah, for me that's a Tuesday. You know, it's uh, it's like I'm a, I'm I'm the guy who would defend the Dolph Lundgren Masters of the Universe movie, <laughs> and and feel that passionately about it. I'll probably win the debate. You know. Um, <laughs> I think that Superman 4 deserves just as much credit as any of the other Superman movies. Um, uh, I draw the line at Batman and Robin. <laughs> you have, you do have your, your Batman and Robin, uh, the, the, the Batman that shall not be named. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Batman versus Superman. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Batman versus Superman. It's, 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 you mentioned you mentioned when we were tweeting each other. You said you know you, you, pretty laid back, and I was thinking, yeah, let's let's touch on a couple of movies like Batman versus Superman or or that kind of thing. And and you can you can hear me actually go off into a rant if you if you truly wanted to. <laughs> well, it's, it's you know it's it's I, I still have yet to see that movie. Um, you know, I want to. I, I want to just because I want to see if it's really as bad as everyone says it is. Um, I've tried watching Suicide Squad. Uh, I've fallen. I've tried watching it two or three times. I've fallen asleep each time. Um, but I, I, I can't give full credit to it being a bad movie for being the reason. It's, it's. I also start watching it at midnight and I'm already half asleep. So yeah, but I'm if you've seen the chance. first half of Suicide Squad. Then you've you've seen all you need to see. After that, it falls into every trope <laughs> and everything. The first half has the potential of taking it in a different direction and being a great film, but then it just falls into the traps of 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 like trying to become an Avengers or or something along those lines, you know. So it's it's. I didn't think so much it was a bad film. I thought it was one that started high and then just dropped. So by the end of it, you were just kind of thinking, ah, what you know, what could have been? Yeah, I've heard that that uh, had a lot of um, the studio getting involved to make their own cut uh, versus uh, who David Ayer's cut. So I, I I think the studio the the benefit that. Uh, Marvel has when it comes to their cinematic universe versus DC is that Disney lets Marvel do what Marvel does. Yeah. Whereas Warner Brothers has owned DC for so long at this point that they don't know how to do that. They don't know how to let DC people handle DC things. So WB is getting involved and screwing it all up. Yeah, I mean, you've got to, at the end of the day, if you hire a director, you need to let them do their thing, unless they're totally screwing it up, unless, you know, you've got someone like, what's his name, Toby Hooper, when he was doing Poltergeist, coked out of his head, and Spielberg had to come in and and take the reins. But nine times out of ten, the idea that that a studio can actually get involved is mind-boggling to me. Yeah. You know, making anything by committee. You know, you yeah. can't make anything. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've, I've done the 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 path where I've done the the desk job and the office job, and one of the things that frustrates me more than anything in the world, my least favourite word in the world, is committee. <laughs> as soon as someone says, "Okay, we're, we're going to form a committee," I'm just like, "Ah, oh, you know what? I'm fucking out. I'm, <laughs> I." <laughs> Don't play well with other people. Uh, if if I think that they're they're if well, best word to use if I think they're dickheads, I cannot <laughs> handle working with dickheads and and having to sit there and keep my mouth closed about it. So the idea of directing a film and having a bunch of dickheads come in and say, you know what, thank you very much, but. We believe we know what your vision is better than you do. I would lose my fucking shit. Yeah, well, and I think that's why, you know, you have certain directors who don't do the studio game. Like, they're like, they're so like, wow, this director, like, you've done... You you've done God's work making this movie. You are like a premium director. Why don't you ever go and play with a big blockbuster? And it's because they don't want to deal with it. They want to deal with their own work, um, you know, and 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 have as much say as they can. Well, it's one of the reasons I'm a, I'm a fan of Kevin Smith because I remember back in the day, you know, he'd done a, a few films. I mean, uh, Dogma raced up there as one of my favorite films of all time. I can watch that film anytime. It is just, it's, I reckon it's just genius. You know, massive, great biblical story condensed into a stoner film. Because outside of the confines of what you're seeing on the screen, you've got a war about to potentially begin to be waged between heaven and hell. And there's got to be all kinds of shit going on. But instead, you've got Jay and Silent Bob trying to pick up chicks outside an abortion clinic. 
Yes. And it 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 is just for me. It's it's one of my. I've got like a, a list of five perfect films. And when I say perfect, I don't mean they're the best films ever made. Um, if, for instance, I can't stand Citizen Kane. I watched it one time, and just thought this is one of the crappiest films I've ever seen. Wasn't entertained by it. Could see from a technical yeah. point of view why people said, "Oh, you know, it's great and and all that." But I just sat there. If, if, if I see a movie, I want to be entertained by it. And a yeah. thing I loved is, is Kevin Smith was getting offered superhero films left, right, and centre. Finally, settled on the Green Hornet. Was going to be making the Green Hornet. I was massively excited for that but then full respect for the guy he dropped out of the film because he said i can't make it i can't take all of this money and i can't deliver a movie i don't know how to do this and how many directors have have really done that in their careers turn around and gone oh hang on a sec this is out of my league i'm overwhelmed i don't do this but kevin smith was able to turn around and go look i know what my faults are and this will be one of them if I go ahead with it. You know? So he didn't yeah. end up dealing with the whole committee process and all of that kind of thing, which would have happened because there's no way he would have been trusted with that film once he got going. Yeah. No. You know? And, um, well, and that's like everyone, everyone wants him to direct the new Batman movie now that Ben Affleck has dropped out. And, that, I mean, that's exactly the point is that he... I think now Kevin, you know, current Kev, I think he could take that film. His his passion for Batman, I think, is there, and I think he knows the character enough that he could direct a really good Batman film. Uh, but you know, he WB would not trust him with it. They would oh, not no. let him do what i and i think i think if they trusted him i think he could take that movie and make it what it needs to be it won't be the dark knight it won't be chris nolan's dark knight but it certainly won't be joel schumacher's batman and robin either <laughs> from what i've heard even joel schumacher would have a, a problem with you putting his name at the beginning of that movie now <laughs> it's like even he's turned around and apologized for it but i think i think where kevin smith Maybe maybe he's already got it in his head as a plan or something like that. But I can see Kevin Smith maybe not heading towards Batman and, and directing the Batman. But I can definitely see him now with the passion and the enthusiasm that he has um, is becoming a showrunner for a, a CW TV show. Yeah. Oh, you know, 100%. Taking yeah. the reins of, uh, of one of those yeah. and... You know, I, and I wouldn't be surprised if in the back of his head he's, or, you know, has kind of already spoken to one or two people and said, look, there's this great character. If you let me come in, I'll, you know, I'll run with it. Because he seems to be directing a lot of TV at the moment. I heard he's directing an episode of The Goldbergs. Yes, yes. So so he already directed it. I don't know if it's aired yet, but he, he's directing an episode of The Goldbergs. Um, it takes place uh, during the release of the 89 Batman movie. Yep. Uh, so perfect fit. Uh, and he's actually going back up to Vancouver very soon to direct another episode of Supergirl already. But TV seems to be perfect for him. He gets to tell these great little personal stories. He gets to tell these, these fantastic stories within a larger universe. And he's... You know, you don't start getting the... Because one of the things I, I hated towards the, the... Or I shouldn't say the end, because he may come back to it. But the, the, the last kind of crop of movies which he did, they were always Kevin Smith films. But not in the same way that Clerks or Dogma or those kind of films were, were Kevin Smith films. It was almost like a stigma being attached to it. And, uh, and you don't get that with TV. You're part of a larger crop. Yes. Well, and, and I think he is, um, he, him doing TV now is more like him just kind of being on set and saying action. And he, he, it sounds like he puts a lot of trust into the machine that's already there. He said it before on a couple podcasts, it, he could drop dead in the middle of production and they'll just sweep him away and, and they can finish that shoot without him. <laughs> uh, but that's great. Like the lack of pressure. You know? <laughs> yeah. 
Now he becomes a showrunner. It's a much different story, and I think we'll we'll see what happens with Mallrats, really, because um, you know we had a shot to see what would happen with Buckaroo Banzai, but that fell through. So uh, you know when Mallrats finally hits hits the airwaves, we'll see what that is, and if if he's able to put together a, a ten episode story arc. Then you know I, I'm more than willing. I think he can do it. I think you can give him a superhero. You can, you know, get, he can. He's a writer. He is a writer first and foremost. Yeah, he yeah. can write the shit out of a superhero television show for 24 hours, like a 24 hour, 23 hour story. He can do that. I think no problem. You know, he can also you know direct a couple of those episodes, uh, and and then hand hand everything else off to the rest of the team, basically. Well. Kevin Smith, showrunner for Green Lantern. You know, I, I I would, and I think eventually we're going to get to the point. We're not there yet. I think there's a lot of characters that DC will let uh, television play with again. I think that a lot of them are coming back. You know, it was a coinc- It wasn't a coincidence when when Suicide Squad was getting ready to release that they killed the Joker on Gotham. That they killed. Uh, Deadshot and Amanda Waller on on the Berlanti verse, and, and now that that movie didn't do so well, we're getting some of those back characters back. You know, Joker is coming back to uh, to to Gotham, or he's already back. Um, I think one of those characters, another one of those characters, are coming back to the Berlanti verse. So I wouldn't be surprised if at some point they just say, "All right, if we're going to be separate, we're going to be separate." They want to play with Batman, give him Batman. And I would I would want to see, and we've heard what Kevin Smith would do with a Batman show with, um, I think it was him and Mark Bernard, uh, Bernard or whatever his last name is on Fat Man with Batman. Uh, we've heard what they would do with a, with a uh, you know, Batman television show. And it was going to be him going to the, the college prep or whatever, the private school. Uh, and, and their pitch for, I think they, they were going to, whatever the private school is that's big in the, in the Gotham Batverse, um, Blue Haven maybe. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely recognize that name for sure. Yeah. Well, you know that, I mean, I, you have to, if you haven't listened to it, you got, you know, or any, anyone in the audience hasn't listened to it. You got to go and Google the, the, the fat man on Batman, Batman television show pitch, because it is perfect i would watch it in a heartbeat i think it sounds better than what gotham is now gotham has grown on me um but you know it's give him a batman television show i think he could take that and run with it and have a lot of fun and 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 just you know be good at it yeah i loved uh mark bernardi i love his um his idea of making a 30 million dollar batman movie which i I heard yeah yeah and he was just saying, you know, make it, make it like noir kind of, kind of thing. And I was listening to that, and I was thinking, oh, shit, yeah, I would watch, I would watch the hell out of a thirty million dollar Batman film, because it has to be driven by story. Then it has to be driven by atmosphere, and and it's not about how big is the car, and you know how big is the cave, and and all of that kind of thing. You've really got to get down to the nitty gritty of, of of Batman. And when I, when I heard him say that, and. Uh, Kevin Smith just turned around to him and said, I will buy a ticket to your Batman film, sir. I just, yeah. exactly the same thing was running through my head. Do it. You know, stop trying to make, uh, uh, like Batman versus Superman is a, is a great example. How, how the hell can you make a profit off of a film that costs that much? Because we're getting to the point now where the money being spent, we're, we're looking at diminishing returns. You you physically can't get that many people into a, a movie theater anymore. But you make a thirty yeah. million dollar Batman film, you're still going to have the same amount of asses on seats. It is going to yeah. make a shit ton of money, even if it, even if it's a flop, because it will make at least fifty million. That's what flops make nowadays. Yeah, you know, I I agree, and 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 I think. And not that they have to to do something that's like the in in the same vein of Deadpool or you know R rated or whatever, but I mean I think you just I, I, less is more. It's the old adage: less is more. Yeah, I think uh, the, one of the things which we're slave to with, with films at the moment is continuity. It's like the next film has to follow the next film. It has to follow the next film. 
Like, okay, why can't we get a, a, a Batman Superman movie like they were originally planning with Wolfgang Peterson that's set in the, the 30s or 40s? And and just have it just have him say it's not part of this Justice League run, but here's just a fun little you know here's just a Superman film here's a here's a one and done. You know it's well, like I, it's a dirty word to to use at the moment is is one and done. Well, you know, and I think they're you know what I think we're closer to to being on the other end of that than than we may think. I mean, look at the X Men movies; they're so. Um, you know, to take a term from Doctor Who, you know, wibbly wobbly with their timeline, their timey wimey stuff. Oh yeah, we, yeah. You know, we, so, and I think they're trying to construct something that's uh, linear to a point, or that makes some sort of sense. But I almost am okay with it not making sense. Like, you know, whatever. It's it's it is what it is. Um, there is no no reason that you can't i mean star wars is doing it star wars is no longer telling their stories in a linear fashion they are now every other year they are every other year we're getting a story and you know what we can start from the beginning we can start from 77 they started with episode four went to you know four five six 20 some years later went one two three and now here we are back to seven eight nine but now in between those seven eight nines we're getting all these like we went all the way back to to pre four post three with rogue one and now we're going somewhere even before that with uh with with uh the the han solo movie so you know star wars is is playing the timey-wimey wibbly-wobbly game perfectly i think yeah. Yeah, by not trying to make everything fit in a row. Yeah, and it doesn't hurt it. There's the, the the most you can say that the way going out of order hurts this film franchise, and we'll stick with the saga films, the Luke Skywalker or the Skywalker saga films, is that there is you know a spoiler alert to to Darth Vader being Anakin Skywalker. If you if you watch episodes one, two, three, well, guess what? You know that Anakin Skywalker is Luke's father already. You know and the, that he's Darth Vader. The thing, the thing with that though, that that, and and this is the one that I reckon most people forget about, is it's not the only spoiler. If you go one, two, three, four, five, six, when Luke hits Dagobah, you already know who Yoda is. But yeah. if you watch yeah. Star Wars: Empire Jedi, he's just this quirky little freak. Who's who's messing around, and then you get the great reveal, as he suddenly kind of, as much as Yoda can, he kind of straightens up his posture, and you start hearing the the Alec Guinness voice in the background. So there's a lot of reasons why um, Star Wars does work in a timey wimey way. And and here's the perfect example. Someone came up with this genius order, and I don't know how it fits now that you got Rogue One and and Episode Seven and Eight and Nine eventually. But pre pre Disney purchasing Lucasfilm, someone devised the perfect way to watch those six saga films, and that was just forget about. Well, you, you start with Episode Four, you go to Episode Five, boom, you find out that Darth Vader is Luke's father. It's Anakin Skywalker. Let's go back and have a three-episode flashback. Or forget episode one because nothing important happens. Everything that's important <laughs> that happens in episode one. This is, this is, and, and this is this is me, not my joke. But for, for according to whoever came up with this, they they were and they weren't telling a joke. They were serious. Anything that's important in, in episode one is one hundred percent repeated in episode two like someone says it again yeah so anything that you need to know about episode one except for anakin being a whiny little bitchy kid is is repeated in episode two so you go four five two three six and that is supposedly the best way to watch those six films uh and be spoiler free because you, you, and, and you get your badass Yoda that way. You get, yo, here's Yoda. We don't know who he is. He's kind of crazy. He's eccentric. Let's go have a flashback where we learn about him now because we're learning about Anakin Skywalker, who we just found out was Luke's father. Uh, I think I have yet to fully watch it in that order, but it seems like a genius way for me to want to sit down and watch the prequel film. It does make perfect sense. 
like it, it's yeah you all of a sudden you you get the big re- revelation of who who uh who Vader is and then you go back and you learn how that actually happened it's not a it it's not a bad idea no i i it's and and i Obviously now with the more films, it's probably harder to do that. And, and I think now at this point, it's it's just like, you know, let's watch them however you want to watch them, um, you know, because they're just all great. And, 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 and now we are getting all these. Like, Rogue One is such an awesome, awesome, awesome story. I loved Rogue One. It was it blew me out of the water. It was Empire level good. Like, yep. it's not like I mean, it's still like probably. You know, it's it's probably be my f- fourth favorite Star Wars film, um, but it it's like it ends. I love the way Empire ends, and it, and and that's how Rogue One ends. It un- yep. ends bleakly. So like yeah. you know, you, you you tell me a story with some Star Wars characters that I don't know anything about. They made me cry about a robot dying in Rogue One, <laughs> and I knew none of these characters. <laughs> like the last now, time I did that with Optimus Prime in Transformers the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and none of these none of these characters in Rogue One you know except for Darth Vader um Peter Cushing's character and the the brief cameo of Princess Leia Leia spoiler alert um and, and but like all these the main characters you don't know and they make you feel for each and every one of them and you've seen Rogue One correct Oh yeah yeah absolutely Okay okay spoilers for those who haven't they all die. Like yeah. everyone that you care about, you they they die. So they get you to care about these characters you've never met before in the seven previous Star Wars films we now have. They get you to care about them, and they kill they kill every single one of them. Yeah. So if you can do that in this timey wimey wibbly wobbly space that 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 they've stolen from Doctor Who, um, then then Batman and the DC universe can do that and. And just do it, like you, one hundred percent. Tell me an alternate. Tell me an alternate story that that takes place in the thirties with Batman. Tell me a thirty million dollar movie with Batman um, that that is very noir. That is very seems like it's set in the twenties. I'll take that in a heartbeat. Yeah, I I I love the idea. I've 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 been saying for a while. The thing that that bothers me with with whenever we get a superhero film or or something like that you know that you're going to be getting an origin story. Like, I, I don't care about origin stories anymore. Tim Burton's Batman movie, for me, it's not a, it's not a, a, a perfect film. It's not, it's not, I think it gets hyped up a little bit more than it should in some ways. I went back and watched it not long ago. We did, a, we did an episode where we, we went back and revisited it. And it's, it's surprisingly a lot like 1966 Batman in many, many <laughs> ways. Um, but the thing that Tim Burton did that I really loved was we just started with Batman. We're two minutes into the movie, Batman's there, he's beaten the shit out of some criminals, then later on in the film we get a one to two minute flashback which explains where he came from, and that's it. You know, that's that's the thing which I I would love if they do with with movies is kind of stop taking for granted that that we're we're all morons yeah you know we don't need everything explained to us i mean how many times does poor fucking uncle ben have to die <laughs> like he's gotten taken out in so many different ways thomas and martha wayne uh, have just been constantly they they've been murdered time and time and time again give them a break you know, let them yeah. let them have one movie off. Yeah, yeah, and and you know what? I think like I, I like the approach of doing it where like you just tell that origin story, like it, you have a two and a half hour Batman movie that that you want to tell that origin story in. Just tell it in about three or three to four minutes over the course of that two hours in yeah. flashbacks. That's all you need. You know, you don't need to make a big deal about it. And that was one of the things which uh. which I loved about the. The Burton Batman was, it had an economy of time with it. It was, okay, well, people are here to see Batman. Let's show them Batman. You know, it's, it's but, you know, it's like uh, Amazing Spider-Man, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Both of them, you spend so long before you actually get to the Spider-Man portion of the, the first 
the first film. Now, the Sam Raimi's film, especially, is a fantastic movie. I love the Sam Raimi Spider Man. Yes. It's it's great. But for me, that kind of thing hurts the rewatch value of something. Because you've got to go through that whole origin story again and it's mm-hmm. it's like you know, it's like rereading issue one over and over and over again and not being able to move forward. Just that's why I'm looking forward to the new Spider Man, the new homecoming one, because they seem to have already set Spider Man up using Civil War. And the impression I get is we're just going to be going straight into some Spider-Man shit. Well, now, I will say that with Sam Raimi's Spider-Man that I don't disagree with the origin story there because unlike your Batman or unlike your Superman, yes, he is a wildly popular character, but I think at the time, there, there, no one knew, the masses didn't know his origin story. You know, in 2000 and one two whenever that movie came out everyone knew batman's origin everyone knew you didn't have to be a comic book fan to know that batman's parents died that's how he's batman but i don't think the masses knew how spider-man became spider-man and 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 why he knew why he became a hero uh so and and for me it does not hurt the rewatch value now amazing spider-man where that movie was you know, with within a decade or so, that franchise was rebooted, and you're telling that origin story again. There's no reason, especially now that yes, Spider-Man, Sam Raimi Spider-Man started, bef- you know, at the very beginning of the superhero boom. Um, but it's still like everyone that's watching comic book movies now, they all saw that movie. They all saw that movie. Yeah, and that was ago. a massive, massive film. Yeah, so everyone saw that movie. We all know Spider-Man's origin. We shouldn't be rebooting the character A, but whatever. Uh, and yes, I, I I have a feeling Spider-Man Homecoming is going to touch on um, some of his origins. I think it's going to be done, but in that flashbacky way or something. Yeah. It's going to be done, I think, very tastefully. Yeah, um, and the thing, uh, the thing with what you were saying about the Sam Raimi stuff though i think that you're um not recognizing the power of the nicholas hammond spider-man tv movies from the 1970s <laughs> <laughs> you're right i'm not recognizing that. <laughs> <laughs> not in any way shape or form it's uh it, but yeah i get it i get exactly what you mean there when you when you put it like that maybe it's because i've had so many origin stories since that Spider-Man film, maybe yeah. I, sh- I should be looking back at it and saying, okay, well, it wasn't a trope when this film was made, but every other film has decided to pick up on that, and I'm not kind of looking at it and going, well, no, this wasn't a thing back then. Yeah. You know? I, I think for, for what it is, it, it, it's, I think... It, it, I, for me, it doesn't hurt the rewatch value, but I'm just a huge fan of that Spider-Man. It was, it's probably, I think X-Men was the first superhero movie I saw in theaters, and that was the second one. So like yep. those movies kind of play an important role in my you know pop culture life. Well, um, Superman 4 was my first superhero film in movies, so, you know, really, it's only, it's only up from there. <laughs> uh, all right, so, so before, because uh, you know we're gonna try to keep this episode to to well, it's gonna be over an hour at this point, but yep. um, I, let's get a little bit more interview in there. How long between uh, being a podcast consumer to being a podcast creator went by? Well, I we only started the the Saturday Detention podcast is now only just over a year old, and it's the first podcast that I've ever done. So there would have been about a 10-year gap, um, okay. listening and listening and listening, um, mainly because it was, it was uh, I, th- I think I was just enjoying the consumption of them that much that I, I, wasn't, I wasn't thinking about doing one, but, uh, but it's, it's very obvious probably from, from the chats that me and you have had together, is I consume a lot of pop culture. I consume, you know, TV, movies, video games, comic books, uh, you know, books in general, uh, a lot of reading, a lot of a lot of viewing, a lot of a lot of music. Music's a big part of, of what I enjoy and stuff like that. So when I when I talk to friends and family and stuff like that, pop culture and and that kind of thing is a big talking point. 
I'll get um, phone calls or messages from people saying, have you seen this yet? Do you want to go and see this film? Um, what did you think of this? What did you think of that? If we have a gathering, um, it'll be like, ah, oh, did you see this film? Or you know, And if someone wants to know something about a nerd topic, I'm kind of the first port of call. So uh, the guy who does the, the podcast with me, Luke, he was talking about um, the fact that he would like to do a podcast. So I was just talking to him about it and saying, well, you know, you should make sure you try and do this and try and do that because this is what a cool podcast does. This is what a cool podcast does. And he was, it, the conversations kind of, and the, the texting back with them forwards changed from, oh yeah, I will do that. I will do that. To at some point, and I don't know when, and I'm pretty sure he planned it this way, um, it started becoming, oh yeah, well, we should do that. That's what we'll do. We'll, we'll, and then all of a sudden, I'd, I didn't realise, but I'd been speaking for about two weeks planning our podcast instead of planning his podcast. Because I was just going to okay. do the technical side of it. I was just going to um, record it for him and edit it for him and put it together and, and all of that. But, uh, yeah, the, the slimy little bastard knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and me and Luke have known each other for a long, long time. So we've 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 got a great way of talking to each other where we just don't we don't hurt each other's feelings at all. Yeah. You know, um, every episode of of the podcast, I introduce Luke as the president of a different kind of fan club. So, <laughs> for instance, we 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 had one where, uh, and this is the one that always sticks out for him the most, is we have the intro and I say, welcome to Saturday Detention, my name is Steve, I'm one of your hosts here, and with me as always is my very good friend and president of the world's number one, uh, and uh, so I'll, I'll put the name of the, the thing in there, So, um, and the president of The Bicycle Man, you know, the world's number one very special episodes fan club, um, and that was a reference to different strokes. Where I don't know if you ever saw the Bicycle Man episode. If you, if you haven't, don't seek it out. It's very <laughs> disturbing, you know. Or he'll be he'll be the president of Balsa Wood Fences, the world's number one A team fan club, or um, it's just something. And uh, yeah, so every but the the hard thing is is each time I have to come up with a different thing that he's the he's the president of. So. Um, I know I can do that kind of thing with him and he's never going to turn around at the end of the episode and, and have a whinge or have a whine or, or something like that. But he's also one of the few guys who can cut me down. I can go on a rant and he can cut me down in just one sentence and make me look <laughs> like the world's most foolish person. And so so it does, it does fit well and I think that's why he was after it is because I'm someone who's very passionate about things if I like them or don't like them or or that kind of thing. And Luke is fantastic at research. Uh, yeah, you need you need that kind of uh, Yeah, help. yeah, yeah. So so uh, that's that's basically how I got into it because the, the plan was never for me to do a podcast. But then once I started doing it, I was like, this is this is really cool. And then I, I, because we do the Twitter like you do, I started to see this community of people who actually get involved with each other and, and you know, this great... It, it doesn't seem competitive. It's a great supportive network of people. And it just sucked me even more and more and more into it, you know? Yeah, and, and, and I'll say as one of our final notes here is, like, that's something that I've been... You know, I've been a consumer and a creator of podcasts for about 10 years. I, I've probably been listening now for 10 years, uh, or I will be soon, and I'll be creating podcasts at, in, for 10 years as of June of this year. Um, and uh, for the first nine years of it, uh, I was doing it because I was like, this is going to be a way to like make money. Like, this is like... You know, I was in it for like, I want to find fame and I want to find like, I want to be the next Kevin Smith when it comes to like, you know, talking and, and, and doing podcasting and whatnot. And I, you know, I didn't realize, and maybe there wasn't a community like, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, but, you know, I started this podcast, you know, as the time this is airing, you know, probably about you know, 54 weeks ago, 56 weeks ago, something like that. Uh, we were a couple weeks into our first year anniversary here. 
Uh, if you joined us at Tattooed Mom, we we celebrated with a Potiversary show there. Thank you for coming out. Make sure you go to letsfcancer.com and donate some money to say fuck cancer. Um, they were a big part of that show. But, um, you know, this last year doing this show, I discovered a podcasting community. You know, I discovered first I discovered a local Philadelphia podcasting society. And if you listen to the episode that just dropped the, you know, within the last week, you know, I kind of talk about that uh, a little bit and 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 what that's meant to me. And, you know, Potter and family, I'll say, you know, I don't I don't there. I'm I'm not as active in Potter and family as as most people or at least not anymore. Um, But. Uh, you know, I, the interactions I've had there, even the ones that were started out, maybe negative, always kind of spun into a positive conversation. Um, and, and every podcasting community, you know, we, we just, uh, a couple weeks ago, everything is awesome. Joins the core temp arts podcast network, core temp arts.com. And, um, great community there like you know everyone's really cool they all kind of share the same things that we share and and share what you share steve and that's just a passion for pop culture a passion for nerdum uh and whatnot and um and they're just there to help each other out and and just you know be a community of of podcasts with one another so yeah the last year of podcasting for me has probably been the most fulfilling year that i've done and 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 have noticed like all these this great communities around i i still think personally i think philadelphia has the strongest podcasting community you know we had a podcast festival last year with over 30 podcasts we're gonna have over 40 this year wow uh that's that's fantastic yep yep yeah and that's just the shows that were part of the festival you know there's so many more uh, in the f- greater Philadelphia area that weren't part of that festival. It's, it's amazing. And, and I don't know, um, I, you know, the, the show that I mentioned that we had a couple weeks ago to celebrate, we put on a little, a lot of people, you know, we got some press for it. We were, you know, I did an interview on radio, um, and some people that I talked to, uh, some of the articles I read about our show, they compared it to like the the pre- preview festival. They've called it a preview festival to the Philadelphia Podcast Festival that happens later in the month or later in the year. We did just did a one day five show thing, um, and it was just it was really great. It was a really great experience. I couldn't have done it had the Philadelphia podcasting community not been as as swell as it is, um, and. Uh, yeah, I don't know what my involvement besides running a show is going to be for the podcast festival. I'm hoping to be a little bit more involved. Um, but yeah, the, the goal is over 40 podcasts this year. So that's, that's a fun time. Yeah, that's very cool. I mean, we've, um, we've reached out to a couple of local, um, podcasters as well. Um, literally only just recently to see about doing a, a live show where we each do a 30 minute, uh, a 30 minute episode. And then we edit it together into one 90-minute episode, and all three of us upload it on the same day. Oh, so, that's neat. That's a neat concept. Yeah, so if someone listens to us, they'll get the other two podcasts. If someone listens to the other two podcasts, they get us. You know, it's um, it was just a thing which we were, we've been throwing out there because I, th- I think, like, uh, that's one of the things which I love that I haven't done yet is I love the energy that you hear on a live podcast. Yeah, it's I mean, fantastic. It's I mean, I I love it. It's it's you know, um, everything is awesome. Isn't my first experience of doing a live podcast? We did one ten years ago, October eighteenth, I think, will be ten years since my very first live podcast. And we more so emceed an event, but it was cool. It was this high energy. We were at a bar and whatnot, and. And that's what it was here, and, and that's part of like our year two goal is to do more of them. We were lucky enough to do four live shows in our first year, um, and and our goal is to do one every other month, uh, and and then get six live shows in 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 this year. And and I you know we're on pace to do it, obviously. So um, it's and I it's 
my, my advice for live podcasting, not that anyone's asking, but my advice for it is, is you got to make your show a little bit different. That's all. Like yep. it can't be, I can't do this show where I sit around and talk to one person for an hour, hour and a half. It's got to be a little bit different. And, and that's what we do. You know, we put a late night spin on our show. It's dubbed. Everything is awesome. Late night. And, and we get a couple of guests involved. We play games and whatnot. And it's, um, you know, it's just so much fun podcasting. Well, if it if this comes to fruition, you'll be the first person I drop a line and say, well, you know, what advice have you got for us? Because you've been doing it for that long now, and and uh, and you you do a great job with the with the podcast. When we first got in touch, I I went back and and started listening to some of them, and and then uh, so now I'm a subscriber on Everything Is Awesome as well, and uh, and it's and it's just That's obvious that it's just obvious that you've you it's a medium that you've connected with, you know, and you do yeah. a great job with it, man. You do really well. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I think that's a perfect note to go out. Complimenting me is a perfect <laughs> note to go out on. Uh, uh, Steve, give out some of your, uh, your plugs where people can find you and your podcast. Uh, well, um, the main place you can find us is on, on uh, Saturday detention. That's where me and Luke sit around and, and we don't have a, a specific subject that we talk about each time. We just we just decide what it is that we're we're gonna we're gonna sit down and, and chat with each other about. Um, and that's the Saturday Detention podcast. It's on iTunes, uh, SoundCloud, and you can find us on Twitter at the Detention Pod. Um, apart from that, um, that's really it. That's where I am. That's where I'm at. Well, and uh, Steve will be joining me. We're, we're going to be rebooting. Those that you know, those that know me, know that I used to do a podcast called the Zomcast, a Walking Dead uh, recap podcast. We are relaunching that um, just in a couple of minutes. We're going to sit down and record that, uh, and and uh, more details on that probably bef- you know before the twelfth probably. Um, so actually. You're al- you already know about the Zobcast. Man, and I'll tell you what, we absolutely fucking nailed it, man. We knocked it out at the park. I've already heard it, yes. you know, because you, you, you post it in a couple of hours, so I've already heard it. And, yep, uh, yep, and yep. You, you were great. You were, you were great. Yes. We, we did a fa- fine job recapping the first half of Walking Dead Season 7. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, so, so yeah, I'm excited for that. Uh, I'm excited to bring that podcast back, uh, and uh, it's it's been going great, as we said. Uh, so you can find Steve there as well, uh, and of course you can find me on Twitter at that nerdy Kev. You can find this show on Twitter at Real Awesome Pod. Make sure you check out AwesomePodcast.com where you can get information about our show, ways to support us, how to listen. Uh, and uh, all our super friends are listed there. It needs to be updated, I know. Uh, and any kind of information about a live show, we will be putting up there as well. Uh, make sure you check us uh, out on CoreTempArts.com as well. That's our podcast network. A lot of great shows on there. If you like my show, every show on that network is better than mine, so you're going to enjoy all the shows there. Uh, and uh, for Everything is Awesome, I am Kev. You've been listening to us right here only on awesomepodcast.com. We've been awesome. Everything is awesome is part of Courts and Parts, a podcast network featuring pop culture, TV, movie, and geek podcasts. Check out some of our other shows like TV Ate My Brain, Let's Chat with Revelin' Friends, and Podstalgic at courtsandparts.com.